always come in there. I'm at a, the Chabot Space Science Center. And this is a recreation of the Mercury capsule. And holy crap, is it tiny, tight. <laughs> I think they hired astronauts that had to, they had to be about five foot eight or something because I'm six foot and I'm just about squishing the top here. But this is a one-to-one -one scale model. Obviously, the catch on the side is not the same, but many of the switches are in the same place and labeled the same. There's, there's bits missing. And there was a, supposed to be an extra panel here, and uh, there's storage areas here. The hatch would normally be on the top, and there's a tiny window here which the astronauts had to fight for, as I understand it. They did not want to be spam in a can. But yeah, this is, you know, to get the idea, this is what the first astronauts took into space, or you know, were flying inside. It is miraculous that they found people to do this. Brave souls indeed. <laughs>Scott Manley here, and we are playing AOK, -okay, The Wings of Mercury. As you saw, a couple of days ago I was at the planetarium and I got to sit inside the model of this, the full-size model, which uh, it's not so much uh, a vehicle which you sit in as so much as you wear it. Uh, it is, of course, the this game, of course, simulates the Mercury missions. It has a demo version, which I'm playing, which allows only the suborbital, and it doesn't allow the networked play. Uh, network play allows people to play as mission control positions and they get all the telemetry and get to call out everything. But I am going to be all on my own EO here trying to do a suborbital flight. Now, of course, I can have a bunch of failures and stuff, but you can uh, make things fail just by pulling fuses if you like. Um, if you have a perfect, you know, if you have no failures, then what will happen is you basically get a flight where nothing interesting happens and it's entirely um, automated. But I'm going to set this up, set up my external view and run. Start the mission. There we go. So I'm bringing up some windows here. And we just click on the panels to bring up the relative, uh, the relevant, ah, cancel, I don't need to change that. That's my retro panel display. So this is the timer. Now there is something on board called the programmer, which basically is a clock. And as things happen, it triggers these events. Now uh, I can go in and find the fuse. And the fuse is in this panel on the right here. You can switch that off. You could, of course, simulate this as a failure. But uh, if you do it as a failure, then you get the ground telling you repeatedly that things have failed. So yeah, this is, a, this is just like a whole panel of fuses here, not that interesting. However, the ones that are interesting is these two panels here. They have all the stuff you need to know for the launch sequence. Uh, there's no actual button for abort, that is the, the Z, Z key if you want to make an abort actually happen. So main launch sequence lasts two and a half minutes before booster cutout. Now, the rocket is based on the V-2, actually. It's, it was produced by the U.S. Army. It's the Redstone rocket, and it was like a direct descendant of the V-2, built essentially by the same team that built that. Uh, you know, they were all brought over as part of Operation Paperclip. And this was essentially a relatively short-range, you know, it was a theater weapon, as they say. It was actually, the Redstone missile was the first one to carry a nuclear warhead. And interestingly enough, it was built by Chrysler, you know, the same people that build terrible cars. Um, they built these rockets. So now we have one minute left. I'm, I'm just kidding. Chrysler do occasionally make decent cars. Um, so now I'm just trying to figure out what else to do. Oh, yeah, what I should do is bring up the flight plan. This is very important. It has all my timing things to, to keep track of. So at 2 minutes 30, booster engine cutout, tower jettison, cap separation. That's capsule separation. There's also emergency checklists. If things go wrong, they tell you what you need to do. Like if you need to abort, if the tower fails to jettison, you know, it tells you which fuses to reset and everything like that. We're probably not going to need that because I'm going to just do all this manually. Uh, we'll need this window as well. And, oh yeah, we'll need the periscope when that comes out. I think we're doing okay so far. Uh, almost ready to cut out. Because I've disabled the programmers, I will have to manually jettison the tower, and that's this pool here. So we got a red light here, so I jettison it. Off it goes into infinity. 
we have Biko. And now the se capsule separates. You can hear the periscope come out here. That lets me look down below me. And uh, it was, you know, it's basically entirely an optical device. So because I have the ASCS enabled, it's going to perform the mission controls that it thinks it needs to do using the gyroscopes and horizon scanners built into the nose cone. You, there's a whole bunch of procedures for aligning the gyroscopes on orbital mission. It doesn't matter so much on suborbital missions. Anyway, once we come all the way around, I think I'll turn this off and try a bit of fly-by-wire to demonstrate my terrible flying skills. There we go. Pitch is down. Now what I want to do... Okay, try. I'm going to pitch down a little. No, I... There it is. Yes, look. There's the booster. Now, you can see, hear the engines just firing. Apparently, not everyone would hear the engines firing. They're very small engines. There we go. Look, I'm tracking the booster. I'm tracking the booster now. Uh, booster tracking stops at 4.15. now. 15 seconds. Now, I can do another experiment. I can take my blood pressure. That is useful. Retrograde check. Booster tracking stop. So let's switch back to automatic stability. So it's going to re pull for uh, position for the correct position. Retrograde check. Okay, so that's it set up. We're going to get ready to fire the retro sequence, the retro engines here. Great, we got my blood pressure. Ooh. 121 nautical miles. Obviously, everything measured in nautical miles here. 445 retrograde. And retrofire is in 30 seconds from now. So let's get retro sequence enabled. That, of course, has a warning light that comes up, so I turn that off to stop it beeping and annoying me. And this is a, a circuit that will check that I'm correctly aligned for the retro boost or the retro firing but uh, you can disable that if necessary okay ready to retro fire 515 excellent and the red light and so the retro fire on the mercury capsule actually consisted of three solid motors that would fire uh, I think for 10 seconds each but they would stagger the firing by five seconds. So the, they would fire one and then five seconds later they would fire the second. And so you would have like an overlapping burn of something like 20 seconds. And since you had three separate motors, you had some sort of redundancy. Okay, so now as soon as I jettison the, re the retro boot pack, uh, which will be at 6.15, the, okay, so actually it says periscope retract and I've missed that. Uh, so, where's the periscope retract? I'll figure that out later. Let me get ready. Oh, retract. There we go. Retro jettison. Prepare for this. 6, 13, 15. There. And now as soon as I jettison that, that sends a signal to the ASCS to get ready for re-entry. So it sets itself in a 40 degree upright position. Uh, if you mess this up, of course, you die. So, you see, this is me. It's mostly just clicking the buttons. The ASCS, if it goes offline, you have to do all that yourself. And it's a lot easier for me to just talk through this if I don't have to deal with it. You can actually turn the camera around and see where everything is. Look, there it is. Look below me. I think this rotate this way. There's bits over there, okay. Uh, oh, did I retract the periscope? Yes, I did. Now, yeah, we're gonna enter, we're doing re-entry right now. Whoa, look at the fireworks. Yeah, that ain't working. Next checkpoint is at 7.30, where I will initiate a, a 10 degree per second roll to stabilize the vehicle during the re-entry sequence. That's this button here again. Normally the programmer would do that, but I'm doing it instead. There we go. So it's now going to start its spin up a little. I can zoom in a little and hopefully you can see that this is now rotating. 
at that. We'll get a nice close up in this vehicle. It's a whole lot prettier up close. Oh, can actually see what's going on here. Yeah, these are these are your horizon scanning sensors, I believe, on here. They would uh, add extra information that would be used by the onboard tracking and everything. And from this point on, it really is like a, a long wait. The drogue will do, be deployed, and then the snorkel and everything else. But yeah, this is uh, the mission is largely over at this point. We're coming back, and it's uh, only a failure to deploy the parachute would kill me. So yeah, I guess, uh, what else can we talk about? Well, um, yeah, the Redstone Rocket was uh, interesting. This was the ones that were only used for the suborbital uh, flights. Later, they went to the Atlas for the actual orbital flights. But the Redstones, when they were developing it for the Mercury program, they actually thought they were, they were thinking about recovering the booster, right? So, oh, I should probably turn something off here. This thing is spinning around. Uh, I'm sure there's something I've forgotten to do here. Oh yeah, let's uh, get ready to deploy my drogue chute. 60,000 feet. How many Gs? How many Gs? Uh, that's probably in one of these displays that I can't see. Oh, there's my Gs there. Very high. Okay. Pop out that drogue. Drogue chute is opened. And I guess I'm low enough that I can now deploy the snorkel. And I get a warning light on my oxygen. I'm not sure what happened there. Snorkel is what let, lets equalizes the cabin pressure. That's what that is. So now we're getting low enough. Ten thousand feet. Let's deploy the main chute. Da da! Excellent. And no need to deploy my uh, reserve chute. Yay! Parachute deployed, and I can deploy the landing bag. Excellent. The landing bag will cushion my impact, so that I can walk away, uh, or rather swim away from this. But anyway, yeah, they were, when they were developing the booster for the Mercury program, they actually thought in terms of recovering it, there was a space behind the capsule, but uh, before the fuel tanks, where they were going to have parachutes. They were going to have three 60-foot parachutes, I believe, which would have allowed the the stage to soft land in the ocean, where it would be recovered and repurposed. And you know, it's kind of interesting because nobody did much with that since, and, and it's only recently we've had um, SpaceX looking at the Grasshopper, you know, for the, the whole rocket booster which takes off and then lands on its own power. And that'll be amazing if it happens, but it's not a new idea. It goes right back to the roots of the US space program. Okay, fuel quantity. I'm presuming that is basically telling me that it's dumped fuel Probably somewhere there is a button to let me dump fuel, but I haven't found it. The The Mercury capsule had, you know, hundreds of controls in it, tons of fuses, all these other things. And uh, I certainly can't keep track of every single one, especially without without the manual here. And the manual is, is very detailed if you want to use it. As I said, the emergency checklists can be fun, especially if you're, like, in an actual situation. Although... I would say that it's much easier if you're uh, playing, if you're in orbit and you have a failure, then at least you have more time to figure out what the options are, what what your problems are. Yeah, this is just going on. I guess I could take a look at my environmental controls. Look, uh, cabin pressure, yeah, is, is now 15 PSI. So I've now got myself back up to normal uh, atmospheric pressure. Normally it sits around 5.5. Uh, you know, in flight, you can decompress yourself and, and bring it back in. And it is possible to actually die from from being too hot. Suit temperature setting seems reasonably fine. I had my suit temperature go off the top and I was in serious trouble. Uh, I thought the mission was going great, but then I died of overheating. So it does happen. Uh, oh, look, there's a rate indicator. So attitude rate, uh, da, da, da. yeah, okay. You can actually test all your warning lights, which is kind of cool. D D. Oh no, we get red warning lights everywhere. No. Um, should I deploy rescue aids? Yeah, I'll wait until I splash down. This is going to be a really long descent. I think we're only like five thousand feet up. Maybe I should have done like a kerbal thing and let it fall longer. 
But yeah, um, so there was only two manned flights with the Redstone, and that was, of course, Alan Shepard, who did the first one, and then Gus Grissom, um, who, of course, uh, ended up... Gus Grissom died on Apollo 1, but... Yeah, Alan Shepard was the first one to take it up there, and he did a he did a great job. Um, you know, he te- he really got a lot of flying done. He took a lot of control over things. The Gus Grissom had a bit more problems. He uh, apparently got really disoriented when he f- entered zero G-, G for the first time, and uh, you know had to kind of fight. He didn't catch. He apparently didn't even see the booster. I mean, it was the early days of the space program. They were still experimenting, and not everything they thought would happen worked. Um, but actually, speaking of early days, the Mercury project actually started out. Um, well, it started out as a bunch of other projects that ended up being part of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which was the predecessor to NASA. Um, also involved was a United States Air Force program, which was called MISS. Man into space soonest. They were actually going to use a Thor booster as their their uh, launch vehicle, and they had a bunch of astronauts selected and they were training. But the only one that well, one of the most famous ones you might have heard of was a guy called uh, Neil Armstrong, who obviously ultimately went into space on Gemini and Apollo and landed on the moon. Uh, it also had a bunch of X fifteen pilots. A lot of the people that were part of this program ended off testing ended up testing the X15s and of course Joseph Walker was uh, one of the guys that took an X15 up to you know astronaut altitude and earned his space wings anyway right now uh, we're more concerned about the US Navy who are coming in to pick me up now that I'm there I've touched down with the bag to cushion my fort my uh, impact I have deployed the the recovery measures, which is basically a die capsule. Because the programmer is, is broken, you have to manually do this. And uh, now it's just a case of sitting around and waiting for a really long time while the helicopter pilot comes in and hooks up to the spacecraft and re- recovers things. Um, yeah, this could take a while. And indeed it did take a really long time, but after it you get a nice little report all in HTML format. You can take a look at what actually happened, how your uh, event sequence. Remember that I was flying this using the power of the force. I did not use the computer to uh, time my activities. And yet, despite all that, I still get a rating of 101%. So, uh, not bad considering. Anyway, the game is A-OK Wings of Mercury. It's available for free as a demo or with a full functionality if you want to pay. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.